So really glad everybody could join us, pumped for today's session. For those that this is maybe your first time joining one of these sessions, I'm Mark Stoddard. I run sales and marketing here at Client Success. We've got Dave Blake, CEO of Client Success, joining us. And of course, we've got Patrick Campbell, CEO of ProfitWell, on as our guest today. Patrick, Dave, what's up, guys? You hear us okay? Yep, yeah. loud and clear. Stoked to be clear. here. PC's one of the best speakers, so I'm excited. Oh, come on yep. now. Got to lower those expectations, not raise them. <laughs> it's going to be good. Everybody can hear us okay in the chat. Let's see. Patrick killed it at Sasser. Can't wait to hear from him again. That's our first chat. That's good. Everybody else hear us? Give us a plus one or something in the chat pane if you can hear all of us okay. It looks like we're good. All right. Let's keep going. So as we've talked about in the other sessions, the, the series we've got, we're in full swing. Today we've got Patrick. Thursday we've got Julie from Drift. Um, both going to be great sessions. Um, if you want to go back and see any of the other previous ones, we've got about 10 other ones that we've done since mid-March. So they're all posted at clientsuccess.com slash webinars. Go back, check them out. You'll see all the recordings. As soon as we wrap with Patrick today, um, we will post the recording for this one on that same, on that same link. So if you got to drop out early or something, or you want to just go share with your team, that's what we've been getting a lot of feedback from is people who are watching it, loving it and sharing the recordings with their team. So go ahead and do that. Um, that, and also another thing, love to get your feedback on the series so far. This started off as just a little experiment that Dave and I were kind of batting around ideas on. And it's taken on a life of its own. It's been really cool to see how it's, how it's grown. We're going to continue to keep it going um, as there's demand. And so um, share your thoughts. I'll put a link to a, a Google form in the chat pane so you can share your thoughts, whether it's ideas on future series, whether it's feedback on things you'd like to see more or less of, future guests. Um, I'll put that link in the chat panel. Um, and I think, Dave, you wanted to share a couple things. Yeah. Hey, thanks for joining everybody. Stoked to have you here. Appreciate those who have uh, been with us long term and, and those that are new. Um, we're, we're excited about this series and really excited for Patrick. I'll tell a little bit more about Patrick in, in a minute. Um, but wanted to also continue to promote our, our uh, program, Help One uh, Hire One. It's basically just find somebody you can help uh, get a new job. There's so many people out there, great talent out there who have been impacted, unfortunately, uh, through this crisis and they need our help. So if you can make an intro, if you can help them with a resume, if you could just be a shoulder to, to you know, a support. And then if you're in a position to hire anybody, uh, please do. Uh, let's get our friends in the customer success space back to work and help those around us. I think it'll be, it's, a, it's a great initiative. We're excited about the, the uh, response to, the, to this initiative. So please help where you can. Um, and then uh, just thank you for coming. These have been awesome. We had great speakers. Please bring your friends and colleagues back to the next one. Really excited about today. Patrick Campbell is uh, one of my favorite SaaS thought leaders and a good friend. Um, he's one of the most thought provoking, data driven, witty speakers out there. I'm setting you up really high, beat PC. Um, we're also That's dangerous. So, we're based in Utah. Patrick is now based in Utah. He's got Boston and Utah now. We're excited to have him in Silicon Slopes. Uh, but thanks, Patrick, for coming. You are all in for a huge treat. He was one of the best speakers in the recent Saster uh, uh, virtual summits. Um, if not, I think the best. And uh, we couldn't be more honored and thrilled to have him here today. So, Patrick, thanks for being here, my friend. It's good to see you. Mark, we'll let you two take it from here. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, great. Appreciate it, Dave. And looks like we've got a bunch of new folks on the webinar. So that might not be familiar with client success. For those that aren't aware, I'll just give you a, a brief intro into who we are, what our story is, what we do, how we help. Um, so you got a better sense of that. But we're a customer success growth platform. And so we help with all things related to customer success, whether that's helping you drive better onboarding, adoption, renewals, growth, anything that your CSMs need to drive a better customer experience. And that's just 10x more important now as everybody's trying to figure out how to drive customer success remotely and trying to figure out all sorts of new strategies. And so if it's been a while since you looked at us, um, let us know. I'd be love to show you some of our new updates. We've had some really cool updates recently. We've added an NPS feature that allows you to get direct feedback from customers natively within client success. We've added a Slack integration so you can take 
all your customer health updates and share them all with your company, collaborate in real time. We're just about to be launching a new revenue management platform. It's going to give your CSMs everything they need to manage all revenue from brand new customers all the way through to renewal. So if you want to have a look, um, find us. We're at clientsuccess.com. Give us a shout on Twitter. We're at client success. Um, again, love to love to chat with anybody who wants to chat with anything related to customer success. But um, so that's that. That's us. And let's jump into things with Patrick. As Dave said, I think Patrick's probably the closest thing we've got to a SaaS celebrity. So if you've ever oh been, to, you've ever you been guys to are SAS, laying it on so thick right now. I feel like I need to like fall out of my chair just to lower expectations here. Jeez. Probably ought to. Probably ought to. But um, yeah, we're we're, we're pumped. Um, every time, you know. What I like about Patrick's sessions is they're always really data driven and that me being kind of a data driven guy, love to understand like the, the, the research that you guys are doing and how that's impacting the market. So I'm going to switch gears and let you jump into it. I'm going to stop share and turn it over to you, Patrick, and we'll keep it fairly interactive. So if you've got questions, I'll be manning the chat pane and anybody who has any questions, pop them in there and otherwise we'll, we'll let Patrick run with it. Yeah, let's do it. And um, yeah, yeah, appreciate the introduction there. I think uh, I, I'm most excited because I think that what, what ended up happening and, and what kind of spurred not only the series, but you know, some of the data that we're going to walk through and a bunch of other fun things is that um, you know, about seven weeks ago, we all got kind of the business equivalent of, of a punch in the face. Um, and it was very much um, totally unexpected. I think the buzzword only because it's being used so often is it's unprecedented, obviously. And what was really kind of interesting is that it really showed how a lot of our businesses, um, we make a lot of decisions based on not a lot of data that's out there. Um, and there just wasn't a lot of data to kind of help. And so what my hope is today, um, we're going to talk about a lot of like tactical things, a lot of strategic things that you can do like in the midst of, you know, everything that's going on in this new business environment. But my hope is to, to give you some data that can either kind of calm you down a little bit um, because you're freaking out too much, um, or if you're a little stagnant and you think that everything's just going to be perfect and hunky-dory and, you know, it's just going to return to normal, um, give you a little bit of like a kick in, kick in the butt to, to kind of get things moving. Um, and so we're going to walk through a ton of data. Um, we're going to stop a couple of different times to kind of discuss what's going on. I want to keep it um, as collaborative as possible and just use these slides as kind of a through piece through the conversation. Um, but yeah, we're going to share everything afterwards and we're going to rock from there. Um, now you heard a little bit, you know, of an introduction, a, a nicely inflated introduction. I appreciate that from, from the CS folks, but um, my personal background um, is in econometrics and math, and that's kind of where a lot of the data focus kind of comes from. Um, I started my career working in uh, the U.S. intelligence community, and then I worked at Google, um, basically taking a bunch of data and, and finding some sort of outcome. Um, so when I was at NSA, like finding a bad guy or a gal, um, when I was at Google, like finding money um, using kind of the same you know, types of algorithms. And then about seven and a half years ago, I started a company called ProfitWell. Um, we were formerly called Price Intelligently. Um, same company, we still have the Price Intelligent product all under the same brand. Um, changing your name is probably the worst thing you can do. Um, it's probably not the worst, but it was a terrible experience, so no, never change your name. But um, at ProfitWell, we, we have a couple of different products, and I'm just going to give you a little background so you understand where this data is coming from. Um, our core product is a free subscription financial metrics product. So you plug it into your billing system, Stripe, Zora, Chargebee, Chargeify, whatever you're using, and basically get access to all of your, your main financial metrics. Um, so your cohorts, your churn reports, um, expansion revenue reports, and we enrich all your data for free with Clearbit and full contact. So you can do a bunch of segmentation um, and, and just really have a good foundation for your reporting. And there's a whole host of reasons we give away that for free, which I'm, I'm more than happy to get into. And then we make money where we have a couple of different products. Um, one product that's probably relevant to a lot of folks on the call is um, we have a product that reduces delinquent churn, um, so credit card failures. Um, so we're sitting on all this data um, and we basically use that data to kind of target like how to recover failed payments. Um, and then we have some other things to help with pricing and things like that. But what's kind of cool is that through, you know, our accuracy as well as like our focus, um, we actually have about 20% of the entire subscription market um, using ProfitWell. And so there's just a ton of data that when all of this hit, um, I selfishly, but also just for our user base, um, I started going, hey, like I would really like some data to understand like how bad is this market right now? Um, yes, I'm probably not gonna be able to make a lot of predictions of this data because of how unprecedented this is. 
But it's one of those things where if I can kind of track like, hey, the market has dropped 50% in two weeks. Like I know this is a terrible, terrible situation versus, oh, this has dropped only 10%, which is terrible, but not as terrible, right? And so that's what kind of came about with this, this thing called the ProfitWell Index, which um, we basically, you know, seven weeks ago already or, or so um, started working um, kind of over time to take all of the data that we're sitting on on ProfitWell and essentially aggregate it in a good way so that you could actually see on a daily basis how overall growth was going for certain verticals, how new revenue was going, how lost revenue was going. Um, so we took all the companies on ProfitWell, we threw out all the outliers and, you know, a whole host of things, did some nice cleaning to the data, any like, you know, math nerds who want to go deep on this, we can probably after this conversation. Um, but we were left with about 15,000 subscription companies that were in B2B, B2C, um, subscription e-commerce, media, all types of different things. Um, and then we started like breaking the data down on a daily basis. And here's essentially what we found. Um, and I updated this data as of um, basically today. So it's as of midnight last night. Um, but the first thing is you're looking at essentially a stock index for the, the, the subscription industry. Um, and we're going to break it down in a couple of different ways um, where we aggregated essentially all of the MRR, ARR, depending on how you want to look at it. And then we index that data. So you don't actually see the, the you know, billions and billions of dollars of ARR, like how much it is precisely, but you can actually see like, is it going up? Is it going down based on that index information? Um, and what we learned is, is that all subscription companies, um, they're not doing too hot, but they're actually recovering a little bit. Um, now, this isn't something where it's like, hey, let's spike the football and everything's amazing. Um, but it is something that's like, you know, kind of telling. So what you're looking at here is basically that growth um, since January 1st, 2019, all the way through basically yesterday. And obviously, you know, all of a sudden COVID hit, boom, like things are going down. Um, people are, you know, basically tightening up their budgets. And then all of a sudden there's this like little upturn that's been happening. And this is just a zoomed in view of this uh, since January 1st, 2020. And what's kind of interesting about this is that when we start to break this down, um, for most folks on the phone, this is actually good news. A lot of this was driven by consumer products. Um, so basically what you're looking at here is just the consumer products, uh, subscription uh, consumer software, subscription e-commerce, subscription media, and they got hit massively. Basically anything having to do with going outside was just destroyed, right? Initially, just because people aren't going outside, they're canceling these subscriptions. And in addition to that, most D2C customers don't necessarily have annual contracts like B2B, right? So those B2B annual contracts, they actually protect us a bit because what we found in the same time period, the B2B has been basically flat. Um, this is what the B2B data looks like. So just strictly B2B SaaS companies, um, you know, a little bit of a dip in obviously the holidays and then all of a sudden like COVID's hitting and you just have this flatness. Um, and this is what it looks like zoomed in. Um, basically you're seeing flatness, which isn't amazing, right? Like it's not like, Hey, everything's going up and to the right. Like it always does with B2B, but the impact, at least in aggregate, um, hasn't been one of, you know, wow, like everything, you know, is on fire. Um, although it kind of feels that way when you, you know, talk to certain mentors and VCs who tell you the world's ending and then other mentors and VCs and, you know, luminaries telling you like everything's going to be okay. Now, before kind of pausing here to like get to some questions and some commentary, I'd love to hear Mark, like your take on all this as well. Like digging a little bit deeper here, when we actually break this data down, um, and I'm mainly going to go to go through B2B because I think that's like 90, if not 100% of the folks on the call. When we actually look at new revenue and lost revenue, what we've essentially found is, is that new revenue actually accelerated a bit throughout the past couple of weeks. And then lost revenue did accelerate, but all of a sudden like churn as well as downgrades are actually kind of like stabilizing. Um, so what you're looking at here, it's just a little bit of a different visualization. Um, this top line is new revenue. So net new customers as well as upgrades. Bottom line here is lost revenue, either through churn or downgrades. And then this dotted line is basically the average daily new revenue or lost revenue from 2019. So theoretically in B2B SaaS, everything's always going up into the right, at least in aggregate. So we should see, you know, be above this line. Now in B2B, another thing to mention, these bumps, these bumps are basically coming from the first of the month. A lot of contracts at B2B either start or end um, on the last day of the month, first day of the month. So that's why you're seeing these bumps. But what I was kind of commenting on is like, we're actually accelerating above this line. Um, and on the loss side, this is obviously terrible, um, but we're actually seeing kind of this, this wave kind of like move forward. And we would look at net daily growth. And again, this is strictly for B2B. Um, you saw this downturn and then all of a sudden you're starting to see this flattening. Um, as well as a little bit of this, I don't want to say recovery quite yet, um, but you're starting to see a little bit of a movement up, which is really, really promising. Um, so when I look at this data, 
um, I think through a couple of things. One, um, one the, the thing that gives me hope, and this is kind of like that founder optimism, is that um, one, the, the, the economy, the global economy, the US economy, um, wasn't amazing before this, but it was like, okay, if not above average in terms of its health. Um, there's two reasons why like most crises happen. Uh, liquidity, like in 2008, um, or a movement of money, basically people can't spend their money, which happened in like 1929, 1987. And what we're seeing is we didn't have those two crises. We just had this like, you know, thing happen. Um, and all of a sudden it's kind of thrown us into some of this panic. And so there's some optimism that there's going to be, you know, some whiplash back. I don't think it's going to be like right now. I think there's going to be a little bit of some extra bumps that go into this in the next couple of months. But the pessimistic side on uh, side of me says, oh, well, yeah, we're seeing this initial bump, but there's a ton of companies who have not caught costs yet. Um, they've been waiting and seeing. They, they've been putting a lot of hope and a lot of stake in the governmental response, um, as well as kind of their pipelines kind of coming back here and there. And so I, I think that the pessimist in me, the pessimist CEO in me is like saying, oh, well, there's going to be a second bump. And so what I've instructed our sales teams to do and, and our retention teams is, hey, like there's going to be a nice six to eight week window where everything seems like it's perfectly back to normal before there's a little bit of a cascading down effect where, you know, all of a sudden people are making those cuts who should have made them, you know, at that sense 12 weeks ago, right? So again, like this is why economists only make predictions in the past. They never make them in the future because it's really, really hard to tell, especially given this situation. Uh, but we're publishing this data on a daily basis. Um, we're going to keep publishing it. We can get you different verticals if you're looking for like a very specific vertical. If we can't get it, we'll tell you, but we hopefully can. Um, but I'm going to pause there. Um, Mark, what's your take on this? Like, are you guys seeing this, you know, with a lot of your customers? I mean, obviously you're, you're really in tune with what's going on in that expansion as well as the, the churn side of the house. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it follows almost exactly in line with what we've seen. I mean, if you saw like right, right when everything went into, in, into work from home, everything remote work, you see everybody that was in, so customers in travel, customers in tourism, customers that even though they were, they were oftentimes B2B, but they were exposed to those industries. You saw them get hit the hardest, fastest. What, I'm kind of thinking about is like, it, to me, those two lines between the difference between the B2C and the B2B line, that makes perfect sense with what I've seen. I'm almost wondering around the B2B line, if we're not just kind of waiting for a dip to come, because oftentimes on a B2C product, I can just turn that puppy off. Yeah. You know, wh whatever it is, if I've got, you know, some subscription app on my phone or something, I can just turn that off. It doesn't bill me next month. But if I'm a CFO and I'm managing large B2B contracts, I've got annual contracts, you know, you know, 24 month contracts. And sometimes I just can't turn those off. So it looks like, you know, you, you see a flattening of the curve. I'll be curious to see. And obviously that means us, you know, looking forward, but I'll be curious to see over the next few months whether in B2B, we just see that same dip that you saw in B2C, but just take a little bit longer to take effect because a CFO can't necessarily cancel a 12 month contract right in the middle of it always. Yeah, and, and to, to kind of oscillate back and forth, it's like, well, but then there's a lot of people changing their strategies and so they're getting some new customers, right? So yeah. I don't know, I, I think that the, 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 the best case scenario, obviously the best case scenario is like, everything kind of recovers and everything's amazing. Right. And I, I think that that's, you know, unlikely to be the best, like what actually happens. I think that the best realistic scenario is, is that that overall curve just stays flat. Right. Yep. And, and that means that in aggregate, there are people who are winning. Right. And there are people who are, you know, obviously losing, but most of the people who have lost because of circumstance, the travel companies, these types of things, they've kind of already been hit. Right. Sure. And so hopefully like those don't continue to go down, but for most of us, we might just end up being stagnant, which, you know, isn't great. And there's a bunch of things we're going to talk about how you can like not, you know, be stagnant. Um, but I think that's one of those things to kind of think through. Gotcha. Yep. So Brian asks in the chat pane, do longer slash prepaid contracts factor into all this data? How does that work? Especially in B2B where most of your contracts might be longer term prepaid. Um, does that factor into your data right here? Yep, exactly. So, so it's factored in the sense that um, we don't, we don't necessarily like take it out or anything like that. So what you're seeing is basically what Mark was saying, which is B2B has a lot of longer term contracts. And so there's, there's potentially, that's what saved some folks, um, from like going down. Um, and so it's one of those things that, uh, we'll probably see in like the next three to six months, um, all things being equal, we would see like the actual effect because basically these companies aren't adding, um, new long-term contracts, right. Or even short-term contracts. Sure, sure, sure. 
Yeah, yeah. One, one other question from Olivier. He says, so speaking of the travel industry, he's like, look, we, we offer solutions in the travel industry. And one of their measures was to offer a six month comp against a 24 month commitment. So I yep. think they're, you know, giving people a break, but asking for a, a longer extended contract. Would that factor into some of the data you've shared here? Yeah, so that that is not fact. So keep in mind what we're doing here, and we're actually going to talk about some of this, some of these questions around like monthly versus annuals in a second. Okay. Um, but basically, the, this is the aggregation of MRR, right? So if you started Got taking okay. um, or ARR, you know, we've looked at it both ways, and it's essentially the same chart. Just the index is different. Um, if you looked at, if you started taking that MRR right now, Olivier. Um, then like it would show up in the data. If you basically were giving it away for free for six months, like it, it would show up, but it would show up as a zero, right? So it depends on how you're actually factoring that in. But this is why, um, you know, some of the pessimists um, or a more pessimistic stance is, hey, this is flat because we're being protected by annuals. And we're calculating right now a little bit to answer some of these more questions um, a little bit more pointedly, um, just in terms of like, what's the proportion here? Um, and what we're likely going to find just given the size of the data set is that the proportion is, is you know, what you would expect, very average with what you'd see in B2B um, and very average what you see in DC, which, you know, basically supports what we've been talking about. Um, got a couple of other questions. Do you want to jump there or do you want to keep going through some more slides? Um, let's go through a few more um, just because okay. I think that we can kind of breeze through probably the next section just because it's kind of speaking to uh, the world of CS um, very, very well, I think. But I think that the the, the big thing here that um, I've been thinking through and a lot of folks I've been talking through as well as, you know, some of our users, um, there's a time for like obviously battening down the hatches um, and basically making sure you survive, right? Like if, it, like if you can't survive right now, you can't get enough cash, there's a bunch of tactics to do with that. Like none of, no, nothing else we're gonna say it matters. But presumably most of us are in a place where we are probably not doing great or we're doing you know really well because we're in a market that's doing well. Um, or we at least know where we are at at this point um, given the past like six, seven or weeks. And so what was really kind of fascinating to me was when we look at the companies that are doing well, that you wouldn't necessarily think should be doing well. So for example, if we were looking at Zoom or Slack or anything that's project management based or something like that, we would expect those to do well right now because they're helping people basically transition into a work from home environment. But if we look at all the other companies that aren't you know, in those spaces, like either they're in spaces that should be doing poorly, like they serve gyms, um, or they're in spaces that are kind of neutral, what are those that are doing well? Like what are they doing, right? And what kind of came about from that thought process um, was this thesis that essentially whoever holds on to the most customers at the end of this is going to win. And what's kind of beautiful about that is like, obviously we know the pandemic is going to end at some point, huge debates, and we're not epidemiologists to understand when and where and what the impact is going to be and how low it's going to go, how high it's going to go, these types of things. But we do know that this is going to end. There's going to be a recovery, right? So if your cash is in a decent place or it's at least in a, a good place, um, what ends up happening is how can you actually use this, this whole situation to your advantage? Um, and what we found when we started digging into this thesis is that there's obviously defense where you're shoring up your churn um, and also obviously your, your expansion revenue. And then there's also offense, right? And there's some things that kind of came out of, you know, even the questions here of what some people are doing to play offense here. But this is actually a really, really cool opportunity to maybe bend some of the rules that you had previously around, hey, we're not going to give this six month promotion for a 24 month contract as Olivier is doing. Um, or we're going to offer up a little bit more in order to get, you know, that annual contract versus that monthly in terms of a discount. And so what I want to walk through is on the defensive side, um, and you're going to find it's, you know, maybe a little pedantic for some of the folks on the phone because these are just the fundamentals, but it's amazing how many businesses aren't doing the fundamentals, um, even if they have a CS team. And then we'll walk through some of the offense things um, that'll help you kind of with that customer base, either those new customers or those existing, existing customers as well. Um, so on the defensive side, um, really, really basic start here. Y'all know there's three pieces of retention, right? You got the active churn. These are people who are actively canceling. You have delinquent churn. These people are who have stopped paying you um, either from a credit card perspective or an invoice perspective. And then of course you have expansion revenue, which is one of the, one of the biggest pieces um, of growth um, or the biggest areas of influence that, I, that a customer success team actually has. And we have the data on that to, to support that notion. Now, what's interesting is that when we look at active churn, um, what we found is that those companies are doing extremely well. They've gone back to the fundamentals of what they should have had uh, when things were going well um, and made sure that it was basically implemented in a really good place to kind of triage those folks who are trying to cancel. 
Um, and what I mean by this is, you know, you have people who want to leave, right? These are people who basically, they, they want to leave for a whole host of reasons. Now, what we found is that some folks for the cancellation button or the cancellation experience, depending on what it is, they've changed things up. Um, some folks have taken the button off the website. Um, that's a very like religious, you know, uh, debate that people have of whether you should do that or not. Um, I'm kind of on the edge of like, eh, you probably still shouldn't do it, but at the very least, um, what you should do is basically redo the flow of how people cancel. Um, and if you're going to take the button off the website, you're basically forcing that flow to change anyways. Um, and you might be in dire straits where you have to do that, but at the very least, make sure you're changing up the flow because what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're understanding why, right? Why are people leaving? Um, and you want to be able to basically start to get that information and catalog it so that you can start to predict future churn and then basically change up that flow as much as humanly possible, or at least get ahead of it. Where if you notice, Hey, there's a certain customer base that we have of restaurants. Um, we know these restaurants are hurting. They're kind of have a run on our product in terms of churn. I want to get ahead of them and maybe be proactive with them rather than like waiting for them to cancel when they've kind of made their mind up of what's going on. Now, in that case, once someone hits cancel, you want to be able to triage like where you should go. And again, this is probably super straightforward and basic for some of you, but these fundamentals, most businesses don't have. Um, the first piece is offering up some sort of salvage offer. So this is kind of a little bit of what Olivier was kind of referring to. I think it sounded like that was on the net news side, but hey, you're going through tough times or something's going on. You know, what if I put you on this less expensive plan for the next 90 days? Um, there's folks who are doing maintenance plans. Um, hey, why don't I put you on this plan, which is even less expensive to just ensure your data is here when, when you come back, right? That's a big piece of this. Um, if you're in super dire straits or you're serving restaurants who clearly don't have like any capital right now or very minimal capital in certain instances, um, hey, let's put you on a pause plan for the next 90 days. Um, and what these all do is basically they can be contingent on some sort of activity, right? Hey, your activity has gone to zero, but the recovery isn't going to be uniform, right? So if you have customers in the South, customers in the New England area, like those are going to come online in a little bit of a different way, right? And so if you could put this contingent on some sort of usage, right? So if it's maintenance or pause, as soon as they come back in, they start using the product again, or they start using the product over a certain threshold, that means that they can trigger basically being back in the product and paying at that original level um, right away. Um, same thing with pauses and things like that. Now, another kind of experimental piece is, you know, having some sort of a freemium tier. And freemium is another one of those religious debates within our industry, um, which we certainly can get into if you want, because we're going to talk about it a little bit further. Um, but basically, this is the idea of like, hey, we'll put you on the free tier. It's I would rather use a pause because the expectations are a little bit different um, than a freemium tier. But depending on your circumstance, it might make sense um, to basically go after, you know, that which makes sense for your business, right? Um, and then finally, like, and I, I want to put this out here because I think a lot of people, we've been lulled into this, oh my gosh, like we just have to hoard everything that we can. But there's a world where like, you know, depending on your business, you don't want to be non-empathetic, but you can play chicken, right? So if you have a product that's a pure infrastructure product, um, maybe you want to offer a salvage offer or something like that, but it's totally fine to say, hey, listen, like we have a salvage offer. We know you're hurting because that gains you so much goodwill. Like we'll knock the price down, you know, of course, if you can to X, Y, or Z, but then just to, you know, expect that person to, to end up paying that. Now there's some of our industries that were, were not necessarily as essential um, in these certain times where we're not the you know, last thing that people are thinking of, of canceling. And so it's one of those things that, you know, if you're in that situation, you probably can't really play chicken. You have to use some of these other tactics. And so what I wanted to do here is just like very cleanly lay out, you should have a triage system, especially on the churn side, um, mainly because it's one of those things that, um, even if you have a limited amount of people who are trying to cancel, um, it can help you get in front of it. And as you know, as we're sitting here, we're trying to make sure we have those customers into the long run. Um, now, something that's been talked about a lot, you know, already just in terms of the questions around the data, um, just optimizing quarterlies, annuals, or, or whatever the term is. Um, we have an expand, expanded report that I can send you just on the impact. Um, but basically, the, the big TLDR here for especially a B2B crowd um, is that annuals tend to churn at a 30% lower rate. Uh, than monthlies. Um, and this is just, there's a few reasons for this. One, it's like one purchasing decision versus, you know, 12 purchasing decisions, even if they're kind of um, static purchasing decisions throughout the year. Uh, but in addition to that, there's a little bit more of a commitment, which then turns into a little bit better retention. Now, what's really kind of fascinating is that when, when we've looked at this even in normal times, and, you know, it's basically the same during this time, 
most of us are asking people for an annual plan, um, probably at like the worst time. Um, and that's typically upfront. Now, if you have all annuals, like you only sell products on annuals, like this isn't necessarily as applicable to you, but you could be fighting for a 24 month contract um, if you wanted to. Um, normally we wouldn't say like, hey, let's have 24 or 36 month contracts. But if you're looking for either cash flow or you know things that kind of support your retention, it might be worthwhile doing those right now. Um, but for the folks who are predominantly monthlies, um, normally we only ask them to sign up for an annual plan when they sign up. The problem is that they haven't really experienced the product enough um, and they should experience the product before you're asking for that larger commitment. And so what we recommend doing is making sure you're going out 30, 60 days um, that they've you know, had an invoice or two. And then basically asking those people all the way up to the folks who have been with you for like 10 or 11 months. Um, and these thresholds are going to change depending on your business. But this is normally what we see when we look at the aggregate data. And then make sure you're just simply asking um, for that annual upgrade. Uh, and it's one of those things that in normal times we've seen, um, you don't even really have to offer a promotion. Um, oftentimes you can actually just say like, hey, you know, you can upgrade to annual here. Or maybe you give them like some sort of add-on for free or something like that. Um, during right now, depending on your circumstance, um, we've, we've definitely unequivocally found that offering up months works better than offering up an equivalent percentage. Uh, and normally we see one to two months during normal times. If you're hurting, maybe offering up three to four. You got to be really careful though, because you don't want to kind of come off desperate and just get too down this path of, hey, we're offering up anything in order to get folks on these plans. Um, but what's kind of interesting is if you start tracking your LTV, and this is how I, you know, kind of back into what makes the most sense, you can offer up like different plans that basically will still boost your LTV, even if they're giving a little bit of a steeper discount. Um, and then we just recommend like making the experience really smooth hey, just reply to this email and you'll take care of it on the back end. Um, or if you have some dev resources, just making it so they can double opt into this um, and kind of go, go on their merry way. Um, and the last part on retention, and I know we could talk a lot about this, um, is credit card and payment failures. Um, I'm not gonna go through like everything. We wrote a book on this and I'm more than happy to talk deeper on it. But just as a reminder, like these are customers that they're not churning because they don't want your product anymore. Um, there's a small percentage, about one out of five of delinquencies that you know, they're just using as an excuse to, to leave the product. But for the most part, these folks don't even know that their credit card or their payment has failed. Um, but it's actually a pretty significant portion of, of your overall churn. So in B2B, about 30 to 40% of your churn is actually from payment failures. Um, and this is for predominantly credit card based businesses. Um, there's some data if you wanted to kind of dig in it from about 500 companies here. Um, technically the largest single bucket of churn. Um, and what's really problematic about this is when we look at um, our customers or our users or you know, just talk to people about this, normally the experience for these folks um, is pretty terrible. Um, we treat this as like a bill collectory type experience where we're like, hey, where's my money? Like we just use the auto emails that are in you know, whatever billing system we're using. Um, and really what you need to do is you need to treat these folks um, as a marketing channel. Um, it's one of those things where we found time and time again that literally just using your CS emails or your acquisition emails, the same tone um, and the same experience actually works really, really well. Um, now there's a bunch of different things you can do and we're gonna talk about just a couple of them because it's a game of inches. So you're probably not gonna have like, you know, time or the wherewithal to do all of these things, um, but you can basically break down some of these or at least do some like simple checks just to make sure you're not doing the worst things. Um, the first thing that I wanted to mention is like, pre-dunning emails. So before someone fails, you can, you know, either through some data science or just simply looking at expiration dates, you can recognize when people are about to fail. Um, I would not do pre-dunning emails. Um, using in-app notifications are great, uh, but pre-dunning emails, meaning, hey, your card's about to expire, they actually increase active churn by about 10 to 20%. Um, in some industries, you have to send these like subscription e-commerce, but in B2B SaaS, um, I would maybe send one email or just make sure the experience is really, really good. Um, and most of the time you just see in-app notifications work really, really well. Um, after the point of failure, there's a couple of things to do. One, just make sure your smart retries are turned on. Um, these are things that just auto retry the credit card. Um, if you're a larger business, you should kind of customize these. Um, you know, certain businesses we see retrying the credit card on the first or the 15th of the month is really effective. It's payday. Um, for B2B businesses, there's a couple of other best practices. <coughs> excuse me, that I'm more than, more than happy to send over. Um, but just make sure they're turned on if you're not going to do anything fancy. So they should be turned on by default. Um, the other thing is just look at the email flows you're using right now. Um, don't use stylized emails. Um, plain text works. It builds a little bit of a reciprocity. 
and just make sure that you're just like not treating these people like they're delinquents, um, even though this is delinquent churn. Like, hey, there must have been something wrong. Like, not sure. Like, just update your payment info. You can get a little bit more aggressive as things go on. Um, and if you can, like, make the experience really smooth. So when they click on these emails, they don't have to go to their billing settings page, which is, you know, not the best designed web, or web page in your site. It's not for anyone. Um, but it's just one of those things that kind of completes the experience. But it's not necessarily re required um, if you just kind of take a look at those flows, if you're just trying to spend an afternoon kind of shoring this up. Um, and then the last thing I want to say about this, um, and then we can pause for questions just for a second, is please make sure you're locking out those customers who aren't paying you. Um, I know that sounds kind of condescending because you're like, well, of course we would do that. Um, but about one out of 20 companies that we talk to um, are basically not locking people out because their dev team, they basically you know, treat these delinquent customers different than their active churn customers as you should but they don't close the loop with the delinquent folks. They basically put them into a perpetual state of purgatory um, or a perpetual state of just, you know, always having access to the product in this gray area. Um, so we've had, you know, in different webinars or, you know, when we go deep in, on this in a, a separate webinar, um, we've just kind of reminded and we found folks who are like losing millions. Um, these are larger folks, obviously, and other folks losing thousands because they weren't locking people out. And plenty of those folks who were using the product actually felt bad because they were like, oh, I didn't know you were, I wasn't paying you. Um, here's my credit card or here's my payment info. Um, but I'll pause there before we kind of get into the offensive side. Mark, anything to kind of add there? I know, you know, obviously we didn't touch too much on the expansion revenue piece, um, but I think we're going to touch on it kind of in this offense sense, offense piece, yeah, I mean, but like anything, uh, anything that kind of you know, came top of mind here. Ton of good stuff there, especially on that slide where you've got, you know, your salvage maintenance and pause plans. One of the things that I'm seeing a lot of companies also adding in, and maybe this fits more in kind of your salvage plan, but they'll add kind of like an add value plan. Yeah, basically, meaning they'll come in and they'll say, instead of cutting your cost, what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, put you on the more advanced tier, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to remove any expansion limits, we're going to give oh. you extra consulting, something like that. That's something I've also seen working really well for folks to, you know, in some cases, not have to take any bit of a, you know, churn down sell or anything, but just say, look, we're going to try to add a ton more value to you, you know, over the next X period of time. And hopefully that, okay. You know, not not only keeps the customer where that where they're at, but that gives you the opportunity for uh for an upsell down the road. So that's another thing that we're seeing quite a bit of. Um, yeah. Few questions. Um, Lauren asks, you know, could you speak to the differences you're seeing between? Um, I'm gonna interpret what she says to see gross revenue and net revenue. Um, in her case, there for Canadian SaaS companies, she's hearing more optimism on net revenue, i.e., doubling down on expanding your existing customers, yeah. and less optimism around growth because you know she's seeing folks expecting a higher churn. So, you know, how are you seeing that? I know, I know, I've seen cases where there have been companies that have even redeployed some of their their new business account executives, their sales team, to be more customer success, cross sell and upsell focused. I know I've seen a few examples of things like that. What are you seeing? Yeah, and the data, so the data you're kind of seeing, um, when we break down that new, that new revenue and the lost revenue, um, what we're finding is there, there are more expansion, like upgrades, um, and there's a lot more downgrades, right? And I think that the reason for that, at least in the, this initial period was, you know, there's just some normalizing happening just in reaction to the market. You know, that one, you know, if you have five verticals you serve, that one vertical is one that just got hit. It was restaurants, right? Or, or, or something, right? And so I think that what we are seeing, and we've seen this in other like blips or downturns previously. So after 2008, 2001, a little bit, it's a little early in the tech world for 2001, but um, even blips in 2012 and 2014, you saw more people kind of do exactly what was just suggested where they put more people on their existing customer base. And I think we're gonna talk about is like in, in this offense period, and maybe this is a good transition is, um, this is this is where you should double down, but this is also where you should get, you know, probably a little more aggressive than you normally would around either, you know, cross selling to those existing users or even getting those users to pipe because um, people are going to be a little bit, you know, or if not a lot of it, um, less inclined to to basically purchase new software but as we've seen time and time again they normally hold on to the the software that they have um, and they're they're typically willing to pay more for it especially if you're on some sort of value metric where you know they're using more and therefore their price goes up so yeah long story short i think we're definitely seeing this it's just you know, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things where if, if this is a traditional um, kind of, you know, downturn, that's going to be the playbook. 
absolutely going to be the playbook. If it's not, um, then it's still going to be part of the playbook, but there's still some stuff you can do on the net news side as well. Cool. Um, Sarah asks, you know, we, we get that all the, the data you have is kind of current and looking backward. As always happens, we get a few questions about predictions and looking forward. Curious, maybe kind of what you've seen, I guess, do you see contract lengths in general changing much after this? Do you see people, you know, being less likely to sign, you know, multi-year annual contracts um, when this is all, when this is all, all over? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I think what, what's going to end up happening is you're going to see um, some folks who don't change their contract strategy um, and are on the low end of terms of ARPU or ACV, so like lower price products, they're probably going to see more of a push to monthlies. And then you're going to see, especially on the consumer side, and then in, in the B2B space, folks who don't move, you're, you're certainly going to see more people opt. But there's a lot of B2B companies who are helmed by, um, you know, exec teams who have gone through 2008 or at least have enough mentors who've gone through 2008. And during that time period, a lot of folks, there was, there was just kind of a push for longer contract lengths, meaning like you give a bit steep enough discount to, to kind of lock that revenue in. So I think that it depends on like how we react to this, um, which is probably the most obvious thing I could say, but that's essentially, that's essentially what it's going to come down to. And, and we're just a little early to see like what's going to happen. I do know that in really good times, normally contract lengths normalize around annuals. Um, and the reason for that is because you're improving the product so much and the usage is going up so much that, and this is not in all industries, but people basically want to be able to raise that price in a significant way, um, you know, every single year. Whereas during not so great times, what we kind of see is, you know, depending on the activity that people take, people actually want to get longer term contracts because they're, they're worried about that churn. Um, so they want to lock people in and they're more than willing to have less revenue. And I think what's kind of fascinating is you're also seeing this in the investor space where investors during these times, they give you a break on your top line revenue. Um, so if you're not doubling every year or things like this, like you're, they kind of don't even look at that. They look more at the unit economics, expansion revenue, retention, churn, all these types of things a lot more. So um, sure. that's why you guys should all keep your jobs and defend yourself uh, as they, yeah, as, right. if there's any cuts, right? Um, yeah, so it's one of those things that, um, yeah, it's a really great question. Cool, next one's a very tactical question. So um, Junaid, Junaid, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, but I'll get close. Um, so he says, you know, we charge companies based on number of licenses, like a lot of, you know, folks on the call will do. Yeah. So do you suggest offering additional free licenses in this situation? Would that help? Um, you know, if there are ideas to retain existing yeah. MRR, like is that, maybe that falls into one of like your maintenance or your salvage plans of, you know, instead of, you know, dropping the price, are we just going to throw a bunch of more licenses in there? Um, what are your thoughts? I've got some thoughts on that one too. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead, Mark? I mean, for me, it's, you know, if you're, for instance, like client success, we'll charge on number of seats and predominantly the number of seats that we sell is based on the number of CSMs that you have. So, um, so in a lot of cases, if the additional seats, if there's a logical landing point for those seats, you know, if you can have additional seats that can be used outside of your core group that you're selling to, and you're not already in some type of like a POC rollout. Um, sometimes it's difficult to do that because, you know, if I've got a product that I sell to customer success managers and I say, I'm going to offer a bunch of additional seats. Well, who am I going to give those to, to my marketing team, to my sales team? It really depends on your product. So if you've got a product that can expand outside of kind of the core group that's using it, maybe you have executive type licenses, maybe you have other things. Um, I see that working really well. Um, otherwise you might just be throwing out additional seats for the sake of throwing additional seats. Yeah, I think you gotta do it in the right way. Um, I would be more inclined to offer up um, reten heavy retention add-ons in some cases, because if, if they don't need the seats, right? And it, it kind of depends on like the way you charge. Like I'm a big fan of moving beyond per user. Like there's some really clear um, industries where per user makes sense. I think CS like software makes sense because each, each um, CSM has like a different experience when they log in. And that's kind of the litmus test. If you can share logins um, and basically everyone gets the same experience, like you shouldn't be using per user. And that's where you might offer up like, Hey, we're going to, you know, your infrastructure costs is going up. We're going to keep you on the lower plan or, you know, a whole host of things. Now, I think that, um, and, and maybe I use this transition to talk through some of these, the, the last section here, because, cool. um, 
I think that uh, there's some things around freemium or just free in general. And again, I know that's a religious, you know, thing that people have aversion to. It's okay. I wrote articles, you know, six years ago saying it's the worst thing ever. And now I'm one of the biggest freemium zealots. Um, so we can all change our minds. Right. But um, I think there's some things that you have your right mindset here, Janae, just around like thinking about where that value is for that customer um, and trying to like keep them around and so that you can plant that seed. And so I'll get to that in a second, but first off, I think there's some, some big things here that are super, super helpful, especially in your expansion revenue, um, you know, targets. Um, the first thing is, is really reconsidering your value props and your ideal customer profile. Uh, so your, your core of your ideal customer profile, why they're coming to you, these types of things probably isn't going to change dramatically. But um, just to give you an example, like if you're serving um, gyms, you probably shouldn't keep serving gyms right now unless that's the only thing that you're going after and targeting, right? But your value props should change pretty dramatically. Um, and to give you some data based on this, um, we run, so our price intelligence software, it's, it's, it, it does market research around value. So we collect a bunch of data and then we calculate that data and then we can get things like price elasticity, willingness to pay, these types of things. And what we did is we had this study and we do this for our content a lot where we looked at a baseline product. So I think we use for B2B like a sales enablement product. We described it fairly generically, um, collected data on it um, from target customers of this product. And then we changed the value proposition and the positioning to a bunch of different things um, and then measured the difference in perceived likelihood to buy or perceived conversion or perceived willingness to pay um, against the control. And when we ran this in March of 2019, what we found is that this whole concept of making you money um, basically performed best. It was about a 20% increase in the perceived conversion over the control. And it was, um, you know, the target customer as well as like comparing the same products, but just changing up the value proposition, kind of like the H1 on the website, if you will. This whole concept of saving you costs, um, it performed better than the control, but it was only about 10%, right? Now we ran this quite like literally two weeks into this whole like, you know, situation in the US. So like really early March. Um, and basically this is what it looks like now. Um, same exact study, um, almost perfectly the same proportion um, of people, the types of people answering. Um, and now all of a sudden this whole concept of save you cost, efficiency, these types of things is winning out. Um, make you money is still winning a little bit over the control, but nowhere near where the save you cost. Now I would expect this to dampen a little bit, but the point I wanna make is, is that for a lot of people, their mindset around how they approach their business has changed pretty much forever. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, people who never use Slack, who never use Zoom, um, who, you know, had essentially like a run on their customers and didn't have like software to help them with it or these types of things, those mindsets are going to change and they're probably gonna change for a long time. When they go back into the office, they're not gonna turn off Slack, they're not gonna now stop using Zoom, right? And so it's one of those things that you have to kind of use like your mindset as well as like what you're doing with your customer base to basically look at like, okay, what are the things that are probably going to change or that I need to throw out right now? And what are the things that, you know, are probably always going to stay core? Um, and it's a really difficult thing to do. You should probably collect some data, but I, I know personally, I got on the call, I got on calls like 30 sales calls um, the week, like we started noticing this change um, just to listen to how people were talking, how they were shifting, all these different things. Um, and it's one of those things that, you know, if you're a leader at your company, you probably should be doing that um, just to kind of see like how people are talking, how they're reacting to everything that's going on, especially now that things have kind of calmed down and we're a little bit in this new normal right now. Um, the other piece here, just around like verticals, kind of mentioned this already, but just to give you a little bit of insight, I can go deeper on this if needed. Um, a couple of verticals that are just doing really well right now. Um, anything that helps people basically transition to working from home. So VoIP, telepresence, et cetera, they're doing really well. Um, L and D is doing really well. Um, and so is like media, like just general media is doing really well. Um, and then subscription fitness that doesn't have to do with going to a physical location is doing really well. Um, anyone who's tried to buy like a kettlebell or weights or Peloton during the past like six weeks, um, it took me four weeks to get a kettlebell um, just cause it's like insane right now to like get these types of stuff. Um, but the last point I wanna make, and this is in the spirit of a lot of you are challenging incumbents in the market. And you're in a situation where at least for every product that we're buying, most companies have at least had a conversation with themselves or with their team about, do we really need this, right? Is this the best solution? And what's really kind of fascinating is a lot of your products are in a position where they are better, 
right? Um, and I know most of you are kind of that post sale, even though you probably, you definitely should be involved like during the sales process, just for, you know, the, the nature of customer success. But it's one of those things that kind of rethink freemium or freemium like things. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, if a customer is trying to leave um, or if you're trying to upsell or plant the seed, as it was kind of talked about before, um, or even in your sales process, um, there's a bunch of things that you can do. And, and the mental model here is when you think about your business, you have two lead sources. And this is something that um, Christopher O'Donnell at HubSpot kind of came up with. Um, you have this river of leads um, and then you have this pool of leads. And the river is made up basically of everything that if you turn it off, the river essentially like dries up right? Um, so sales, events, demand gen, these types of things. If, if you turn them off, if they're not working, you're not getting the leads from there. But on the pool side, there are these different sources that basically give you, you know, continual leads, right? So content, you know, you could look at like SEO, like you stop blogging, um, you're still going to get a bunch of leads from there. Yes, over time, it'll probably go down at some point. Um, but, you know, there'll be blog posts that'll still bring you leads, you know, for a really, really long time. Now, another big one of this is, is freemium right? And it doesn't mean that you have to have like a freemium type plan. Um, but there is a world where you look at some of these prospects in order to move them into like being a, a pseudo customer or basically a user of the product, you can actually bring them in either through a six month contract um, or a 24 month contract where the first six months is free, whole host of different things that, that you can do. And some tactics that we've seen work really, really well um, are things like, um, and this one's super aggressive, buying out competitor contracts. Um, so if, you get a, if you're getting a lot of objections of like, ah, we're just going to stick with, you know, incumbent A or something like that, you know, we got this long contract. Well, hey, we'll give you that contract for free and we'll throw in an extra three months. It's super aggressive, um, but it's one of those things that we're seeing it kind of work in certain spaces, especially when you're challenging like some big enterprise behemoth. Um, extending trials for six to nine months, this has been a big thing. Um, we've also seen like turning your free trial into a freemium plan. If you kind of want to jump fully in, um, or at least use this as a time to experiment. Um, and then of course, like playing offense when it comes to, you know, your go to market as well as kind of your existing customer base. Um, you always have to use your best judgment, obviously. Um, but it's one of those things that, um, really kind of focusing on how do we plant the seed for this new product or this new product line or this new add on, maybe we give it to them for three months, six months, et cetera. And then after this, they actually really liked using it or they're really into it. And then therefore they're able to, to kind of get back on board. Um, because the big thing, you know, as we kind of said in our thesis is like whoever has the most customers at the end of this is going to win um, and creating that pool of users that are then, you know, you are, you know, basically like, you know, obligated to you in some way because you helped them out um, or you made it easy for them um, is one of those things where there's a really, really good place to win. Um, but I'll stop there. Everyone get some value. Everyone's still fired up. Hopefully yeah. everyone's falling asleep. I know I have. I know I have. And going yeah. back to your slide there, I see the, you know, the buyouts or all those different strategies. I listen to Lemkin a lot, Jason Lemkin. And one of the things he always talks about is, you know, in SaaS, we're trying to get customers for five or 10 years. So at the end of the day, like who cares if I extended their trial by 90 days, if it gets me another five to 10 year customer at the end of this, I came out on top of it. If I buy out a customer, if I buy out a competitor's contract and that involves me giving away software for six months, but you get a 10 year customer, who cares, man? Yeah. Um, and I think that's the thing. And we've been, we've been as a, as a customer success, I, I like to call myself a customer success CEO because you, you need more of those out there <laughs> because it's yeah, right. such a long-term thing, right? Like the beauty of the relation or the subscription model is the relationship is baked into directly how you make money, right? And I think what's problematic about a lot of companies is they're, they're looking at that first 30 days, first 90 days, um, and that's the entire um, litmus of their success or not. And so I think it's like that long-term thinking can help a lot. Yeah, there's some short-term tactics you have to do and we're not gonna accept everyone and we're not gonna like, you know, use every tactic, but sure. it's a really, really big thing to kind of focus in on, you know, what makes the most sense. Cool. I want to get to, I know we're tight on time. I want to get to the, this one question popped up from Frank that I thought was interesting. So I want to go get your thoughts on his question and then maybe we'll just wrap up with final thoughts. Let's do it. Um, so Frank says, you know, could you speak to business models that are non-contractual? For example, our business model is non-contractual, but subscription based. So it basically means a customer can stop our services at any time since the customer is not locked into anything. So 
for you, what's your opinion on, you know, best approach to retaining those types of customers that technically no, ha have no, no commitment? Um, yeah. What's your best practice on those right now? Yeah. So I'm assuming it's, it's either, well, if it's a subscription, then it's, it's probably like month to month. Um, um, or like, I guess you could call a subscription something that's like pure usage, meaning they're only- That's what I see is more like usage. Yeah. So that's what Frank's yeah. saying. So I think, I mean, so, so in this situation, um, and, and if you're, if you're in a certain market, like there's certain markets that just loathe subscriptions, but they've been coming around so much. And so normally what we've seen, um, and when we work with like Autodesk on the pricing side, um, you know, the, the, those CAD designers, they do not want subscription software. <laughs> they love yeah, professional right. licenses, right? And so what, what's happened is what they'll end up doing is they'll still offer like the usage model um, where it's like pure pay for performance or like, hey, whatever number of emails you use in that month, that's what you get charged for. And then they'll also offer up like a subscription alternative and they'll make that subscription, um, you know, beneficial in some particular way. Uh, and I think that that's, that's really where like, you know, for example, with, you know, our AWS bill at the end of every year, we always pay as much as we can up front, um, basically because, you know, we get a deal, right? We get, you know, in some cases, 40 to 50% off when we pay up front. And so I think that assuming your software um, or your product is not, um, you know, incredibly cost basis, it's not like bandwidth or something like that, but even then you have some ways around this, I would offer up an alternative subscription plan where they can get a break, Right. Um, and theoretically, it's, it's, you know, it's just, you know, it's software. It's not like there's a significant cost to giving them a break. Um, and you can position it as a, a premium where they get certain things with that subscription. Um, even, if, even if you think that they're not that fascinating, like priority support, um, you know, premium access to something, like people, people do convert for those things because they want more or they've been burned in the past, those types of things. So I think that the shortest answer for me is, one, all of the things around like, client success around like making sure, hey, we got to make sure that our product is good and people keep coming back and they see the value. All that is obviously like, you know, a, a bigger part of this, but I would tactically get to a subscription option um, sooner than later so that people can, you know, get a break and then you can have a little more predictability on your revenue, but also predictability around your retention. And one other thing I would add there, and this goes back to a session we did back in January with the guys at Weave, but if you're going to run that type of a business, you've got to be vigilant at being able to not just drive usage, but be able to turn around and show both the return on investment of people using your software, as well as the return on effort. So what are the things that they're getting? And they've got to be crystal clear on, if I'm using this usage-based product, I've got to know every single time or you know, very frequently, what's the value of me getting that? Because if it doesn't have a contract associated to it, it's probably going to be one of the first things that your CFO looks at to say, how can we drop that cost? And so you've got to be, you know, you've got to be vigilant about making sure that people are very clear the value they're getting from driving usage through your platform. So if it's a usage based thing where they're, where they're um, saving costs, cool. You got to put that in front of the right decision makers at all times. 100%. Cool. Well, let's, uh, there's a few other questions. We're not going to have time to get to anything, to, to get to everything. I'll keep track of them. Maybe Patrick, I can send them over to you afterwards and we can um, do a, do a follow-up email. But um, what, um, what, what final words do you have for everybody, Patrick? Yeah, tactically, if you want the data or we can look to see if we can get you verticalized or like more specific data, um, just email me at patrickprofwell.com. We're updating this every single day. I think that... Um, more uh, broadly, like it all comes down to value, right? And there's a bunch of tactical things you can do and theoretical things you can do just around making sure you're providing that value and reinforcing that value. Um, that's, that's the job. And um, yeah, it doesn't change just because things are going a little bit insane, um, you know, in the environment. Right, exactly. Well, cool. Thanks so much, Patrick. This was awesome. I learned a ton. Um, I know everybody else learned a ton. And so we'll, we'll take the recording, we'll send the slides, we'll send the recording and a follow up so that everybody has them. Um, and for those of you that are on the session, get excited for Julie Hogan. She's, a, she's a rock star she's from HubSpot and Drift, um, friend of mine for, for 10 years. Um, so she'll be able to share a bunch of really cool stuff on what they're doing at Drift around customer experience. And so really excited for that one. And again, thanks for, Thanks to Patrick for joining us and we'll, we'll call it a day.